Hello, and welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast, the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. Don't be confused. I'm not Matt Farrell. <laughs> no. That was Matt Farrell. Matt, say hello. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Sean Farrell. I'm Matthew's brother, and I am the interrogator on this program. Today, we're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode, which was The Mechanical Battery Explained. A flywheel comeback? What's that you say? <laughs> this episode dropped on January 5th, 2021. And what an ignominious start to 2021. Yes. Yes. Here's hoping that calmer minds will prevail, people will stay safe, and idiocy is in decline. Though I, I feel I, like I'm not I, holding I my like breath. <laughs> I feel like we're living on a flywheel right now. <laughs> Yes, and as you said, the faster a flywheel goes, it can reach the point where it literally tears itself apart. Yes. So we need to beware <laughs> Slow the of sucker how down. fast history is spinning. <laughs> yes. Please. Slow the mother down. So flywheels, a technology that's been around for a long, long time. The applications that you've talked about are very similar in principle to the water batteries, it's such a return to such an old school principle. Yes. What first caught you? How did you first see this as one of these mechanisms that was on the horizon? Was it something that in other research you came across it or did somebody point it out to you? A little bit of both. It's one of those, of all of the technologies that I talk about when it comes to energy storage, the ones that always fascinate me the most are the mechanical pumping water up a hill and then letting it run back down. Wait, Wait, dropping a weight into an old well? What? It's like these kind of very just physics driven, just they're not chemical based. It's just lifting and dropping weights or spinning something really, really fast and then capturing the energy as it slows down. These kind of things just fascinate me because it's just, it feels like we've known how to do this for hundreds of years. Why have we not done this earlier? Like this is nothing earth shattering that we're doing. But we're kind of going back to this old well of knowledge and finding ways to improve upon it and make it super efficient and hopefully more cost effective. And when I've done other videos on breakthrough lithium ion batteries or the other videos I've done, people have, have typically left comments of like, what about flywheels? I've gotten that question a lot. And when I started getting that question, I started looking into it myself and was just like, once again, just it scratched that itch for me of holy cow, here's this really old thing that we've known how to do for a very long time and we're starting to do more and more of that now and there's a whole bunch of companies trying to make this a real thing as far as, as, far as like grid scale energy management systems. So it's it just kind of like the Venn diagram of <laughs> everything just kept po pointing me in this direction. And it's a little bit of be careful what you wish for. I've mentioned this on the show before. I'm always very interested in those dystopic images of here's a little machine spinning away on, yeah. you know, <laughs> like you find somebody's little hovel and then there's this little machine on the roof and it's got these spinning wheels and things going up and down and it's never clear as to what that thing is. And yeah. there's part of me as a sci-fi writer and consumer that I'm, I'm just like, I love imagery like that. Like, Oh, here's a little machine that's not yet broken, but it might break. But what does it do? We don't know. <laughs> and, and I love all of that. And here we are looking at now that kind of imagery in real life, like it's here. Meanwhile, yeah. be careful what you wish for, dystopic reality seems to be <laughs> swarming all around us. I'm wondering about some of the places where you talk about it being used. These are test cases. These are initial attempts to say, is this a usable thing? Yeah, there's lots of pilot plants is typically what you refer them to them as. Like they're not small. I mean, they're they're pretty right. big, but they're test. I meant beds. small scale in the sense yeah. of they aren't going like they're not statewide in Massachusetts. There's a site no. and they are seeing yeah. how it works. Yeah, like in Massachusetts, there's a couple sites here in Massachusetts doing it. There's places in the UK and areas of Europe that are testing systems just like this. And so they're finding ways that it works and doesn't work. They're finding how it works out for maintenance over time and all that kind of thing. So it's these are just pilot plants, but they're very, very promising. The biggest hurdle, I kind of touched on it in the video, for this is its price. It's like it's a really robust technology, 
but it's still crazy expensive when you're looking at it compared to lithium ion batteries. Right. So the price still has to come down. And I'm, I didn't find a good answer to this, but I couldn't find a good answer as to why it's so expensive. Um, right. Con- considering <laughs> it's much simpler. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's a simpler technology that doesn't degrade over time and basically big spinning drums that you bury into the ground and you can level out your energy use. It's, it's not meant for like liquid air battery storage, that video where you could, you could store a day's worth of energy in that system. You were saying that the confusion around the cost is still a, a question, a question mark for you. I would say, I think that anytime you have mechanical aspects to something, I can, mm-hmm. I can speculate that there's a lot of physical manufacturing of something strong enough to go through that kind of physical torment that the drums would go through, the desire to avoid any kind of catastrophic failure where it would shatter and explode effectively out of its own speed. Yeah. Um, I can also ex- speculate that the installation costs could be very expensive, especially when compared to, like you mentioned, the liquid air where that was largely using components that are already manufactured because of like the petroleum industry. Yeah. And I could imagine that this is very specific manufacturing that isn't done across the board for other yes. purposes. So I could I could yeah. speculate as to where some of those costs might be. Yeah, the the costs will go down over time as if and when this scales up, costs will go down because right. there's scales of account the, the the as you scale things up, things get cheaper to manufacture. So it's, that's going to happen. But the question is, how low will it go? It's like, will it go low enough? There's right. a, just a gigantic question mark around that, if it will I, ever get cheap enough. I also wonder if there's a, other than the cost, is there a is there a point where even if the cost doesn't go lower than some of those other um, processes and storage facilities, is there a point where there's a byproduct of this that would be beneficial? Like the the use of them in trams in Switzerland almost seems to signal that if there's a an application for the technology as you scale it up and down, it seems to me like the physical scaling of this would be would potentially have other uses. And I'm wondering if there are companies that would be able to subsidize one end of the scale, whether it's the large or the small, by the other. And right. that there might be ways that this could be used. The, the idea that there was something like this at work in a tram back in the 60s yeah. is really, that's both surprising and not surprising in a strange way. It, it kind of makes sense. Well, it's been around for so long. Of course they were using something like that. But at the same time, wait, they were using that? But it, to kind of build on that, in small scale, it's already in use, uh, where it's like uh, companies that make basically UPS systems, which is like power supply backup systems for data centers or computers. Um, those already exist today, mm-hmm. and they're in use. And I thought it was really funny because somebody in the comments of the video said, "I work in IT," and the last company he worked at actually used one of those systems as a backup for their data center, and he said it was the cleanest most uh, level energy performance they got at any of the systems they used. So when it would flip over to the flywheel system, if something went sideways, hmm. there was not even a single blip in the system. And it was the cleanest, most consistent energy they could get. So he said that it, he was became a fan of it because it was really good. And so there's a use case where it's already in use today, but it's a very small scale. It's just right. small data centers using these like UPS systems that are just basically just little flywheels and little cabinets <laughs> spinning <Right>. away. <laughs> you mentioned the comments, so I'd like to dive into them right now. Top comment from Spock. I mean, there you go. You don't go get more logical than that. No. And Spock wrote, we are close to our goal of using a hamster for our energy. <laughs> yes. I, I love this comment. Yeah, that was, uh, I thought that was spot one. on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the follow-up, to that was from Eduardo Raphael, who wrote, hear me out, a flywheel made of lithium ion batteries. <laughs> Check out the big brains on Eduardo. 
it's, just, just picture a big cylinder battery just spinning really fast. Yes. <laughs> With a bunch of people in white lab coats, clipboards, notes t- being taken, and one guy in the back going, was this a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> JP wrote, maybe you covered this and I didn't understand. But what is the cost per kilowatt hour averaged over the lifetime of a flywheel, including installation and eventual recycling, and a long life expectancy as compared to lithium ion? It's not just kilowatts installed, but total kilowatt hour delivered that makes this worthwhile or not. Right. Um, I did cover it briefly where I talked about like the flywheel energy storage costs. Um, Let me pull it up. It's the cost varied between $1,500 per kilowatt hour and $6,000 per kilowatt hour. That's what that number is. It's taking into the full account of here's what the system is, installation, use, the whole thing. Here's the whole what life it costs of it. per. Yeah. So it's like that's what it is. And that is, just to put that in context, really high when you're talking about something compared to battery storage where it's in the $400 range or liquid or energy storage, which is in the four to $500 range range so it's it's crazy high right now and it's expected to drop like one of the numbers i found was like by 2030 it was supposed to drop to uh somewhere between 77 dollars and 574 which is a pretty big spread (laughs) but but that (laughs) if you were to tell me (laughs) that something i was going to be buying yeah had that big a range in nine years your milk might cost anywhere between twelve (laughs) dollars a gallon and four hundred and thirty eight dollars a gallon i would panic (laughs) i would what but you gotta understand it's like it's that puts it in the realm of lithium-ion batteries you know what i mean it's like right actually no it wasn't that that was lithium-ion batteries it was still a thousand dollars i think it was for Mm. flywheel so it's still more expensive than lithium-ion by 2030 but the price is less out of line than it is today. Like today, right. it's dramatically more. By 2030, it's expected to narrow that gap, but it's still going to be more expensive. And so that's where the big question mark of, can it ever get cheap enough? Um, the question, I think there's value to which one is easier to produce, which one's easier to install, which one has less um, side effects on the environment, those mm-hmm. kind of things could motivate some companies to maybe pay a little bit more for a flywheel versus lithium ion. But also by 2030, we're going to have battery technologies that are <laughs> dramatically safer than they are today. Right. Like we'll, we'll have solid state batteries. We'll, we might have, you know, be using different salts and things like that for our batteries where it's, they're, they're just fully recyclable, you know, the whole thing. So it's the future of flywheel technology, I think is going to be, Personally, I think it's going to be very niche. Right. Although there is a very good argument to be made for something that exists today that is already going to avoid environmental impact. Yes. In that way. You could say, oh, well, in 10 years, battery technology might be in a place where it's 100% recyclable. Well, you have something that's 100% safe right now. And if an earthquake hits a power plant and it's got flywheels on it and the flywheels crack... You're not going to have chemicals leaking into the groundwater. You're not going to have uh, a, a plume of poisonous gas sprayed across a, a region. Um, right. So there are that that I think to me makes it for a very good argument, despite the cost. And I'm fascinated by that. The, as you've mentioned in your other videos, like the water, the 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 frozen air. Um, the physicality of these things is really a major, major selling point in my mind. I, I think that's really interesting. Yeah. When I talked to the CEO of Highview Power, which was the liquid air energy storage company, he brought up the whole thing of the one thing that it drives everything is cost. What is the cost per megawatt hour? And he said, that's what's going to win. And he was using that as the point to make of these different systems have different efficiencies. Like this one only recovers 70% of the electricity you put in. This puts 90% of the electricity back out that you put in. And when you look at lithium ion batteries, they have some of the highest return. They're over 90% efficient. Liquid air 
is somewhere between 50 and 70 percent right now and then you've got this which is you know around the same realm 70 percent or so and his point was it ultimately doesn't matter because whatever is the cheapest return per megawatt is what's going to win because that's where utilities are going to go which is why i keep bringing up it's like if the flywheels are twice the cost of a battery that's i can't imagine a utility (laughs) <laughs> for environmental reasons only <laughs> right going the flywheel route because they're going to see hey man we can cut our costs in half if we do this thing um that's throughout history been the thing that drives everything so it is important for it to go down which is why i say it's going to be more of a niche thing because it's already in use for data centers and things like that because it it makes a lot of sense there probably cost wise and efficiency and energy wise it makes a lot of sense but for utility scale specifically it's like, for me, the jury is still very much out if this will even succeed. Also from the comments, there was this from Jacobadia Zenitram. For my dad's senior project in college back in the 80s, he made an electric car powered by a flywheel. Yeah. Mind you, it was mostly a proof of concept, but still, I've always loved flywheels since he told me that as a kid. And I love that idea. Yes. There's something about that that's really magical in thinking of, you point out that Tesla's cars use braking in order to generate energy so that you've got energy produced through driving. And I love the idea of a car that would be powered entirely by the motion of a car. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, how do you make it go? Well, once you're going, you're great. You can keep going. You need a hill to start. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> okay, kids, get out and push the car. Yeah. Once we get going, we're good, but yeah. uh, we got to get going. Don't make me stop, because if I stop, we can't go. <laughs> A couple of points of correction from your viewers in the comments as well. One was mm-hmm. from Robert Sylvain, who said that at four minutes, 30 seconds, that's a Sprague clutch. <laughs> Not a bearing. Yeah. It, it only allows for one direction of rotation. And then he gives you a compliment about how much he likes your videos. I interpreted that moment in your video as you were saying the word bearings, but you were not intending to say this is a bearing. Correct. Yeah. (laughs) It seemed very much like it was, I have a bunch of images. Here are some images of the machinery that goes into this thing while you happen to be naming other parts of the machinery. And we're not intending to endorse the idea that this was a bearing. Correct. It was that was just bad timing in the video and the use of the B-roll. It was yes. yes. It's a good thing that at that moment in the video you didn't say, My wife. <laughs> it's a sprag clutch. <laughs> it's a sprag clutch, Matthew. For the last time. <laughs> you are not married to a sprag clutch. Another corrective. And this is one I wanted to get your response to because I think that this commenter is right. And I think that it may have just been a case of word replacement in your in your mind when you're working on your script. Mm-hmm. Bram Mormon writes, for the International Space Station, that would be attitude, not altitude. Yeah. Yep. And he goes on to say he'd always considered a motor slash flywheel generator for a home office surge protection system. So I guess there's two things to talk about there. One is, I assume it was simply one word got replaced in your brain as you were working on the script. Yeah. Yep. It was, that was just a straight up error. Yeah. (laughs) It was a oopsies. Yeah. (laughs) The video's live and I can't change it. (laughs) Yeah. And as we've talked about before, YouTube not making it easy for no YouTube creators to replace something even when it is having an impact on the meaning of a sentence yes. and you want to make sure that you're getting the right information out there. Um, I didn't look for it, but did you put any kind of note beneath the video saying, Oh, there's a correction at the not yet. Blah, 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 point? To, I, not yet, but I am going to be doing that. Yes. The other point that he makes and i think this is an interesting one we've talked about this technology being used on large scale and you mentioned that there was an it commenter who said that this technology was used at the at an it installation but is there anything like this for the home user where they would be able to have this kind of 
flywheel battery at home for this kind of, if your power goes out, this thing would kick into gear and you would have several hours worth of home energy production. I did not find a single place for something like that. No. Yeah. I, I think I think it really does come down to cost and also how much energy it's storing. Mm -hmm. Where for like a data, data center for short bursts, like to cover a data center for a couple hours, it makes sense. But for a home, it's like to get enough storage, I think it would just be absurdly expensive compared to a lithium ion battery, which is already very expensive. So it's like, <laughs> like getting a power wall in your home is already expensive. Now imagine doubling that cost. It's like, I don't think it would go anywhere, which is why I think you don't see it on the market at all right now. I also can't help but have the cartoonish image in my head of some black box that somebody has in their home and somebody says, well, what's that? And you're like, well, that's my backup flywheel battery for my computer systems in case the power goes off, that thing kicks into gear and then the power kicks off and this thing proceeds to spin itself around the room. <laughs> <laughs> I should have bolted it down. Final comment, and I would like to bring this one up simply to see if you are using this as part of an ongoing list of future videos. Eric Lotz wrote, can you do a video on, quote, power to X technology? I saw that comment, and yes, it's. I did not know anything about that. Um, I haven't looked I, it I, up, but I am yeah. curious, did you, can you give yes. us a teaser as to what it is? and let us know if you're going to be doing a video on it. I only did a cursory look into it, but it's basically just mm -hmm. different technologies that are, it's basically energy storage, and it's kind of a different uh, view of it. So like the X can refer to uh, ammonia or chemicals or gas or hydrogen. It's kind of like fill in the X. It's like a an equation. Mm -hmm. So it's like I already kind of talk about these things. It's like the liquid air energy storage flywheels. It's like that's the X mm -hmm. in the power to X. Uh, but there is an aspect to it that I thought was interesting. So I am looking into it. I can't guarantee there'll be a video, but I am currently digging into it more. Is it more of a big picture theory view of of this field as opposed to yeah. a hard dive into one specific technology? Yeah, it seems to be a higher level concept. Hmm. It's like a line of thinking and, a, and an approach to this stuff that that it's not a specific technology from what mm -hmm. I've been seeing. But right. I, 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 like I said, I'm just starting to dive into it. But I was I was intrigued, so I added it to my list. So I, yeah, that sounds intriguing to me. I think that yeah. would be because there's a certain point where you are talking, you are at a level where you're sort of eye level with the weeds, mm -hmm. you're not down deep into them and lost in one technology. But I think a pulling up above and giving sort of a bird's eye view of the entire field could actually be very, very interesting. So yeah, as I mean, one like, of your viewers, I'm encouraging you to like, yeah, give us, give us some more big picture stuff. I think that sounds cool. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like one idea would be like, for this is you're taking the output from something else and you're using it to power something else. So right. you could take the hydrogen and the CO2 that's being put out from this thing, convert it into methanol and use it for this other thing. Right. So it's, it's kind of like this ecosystem approach that it's, right. it's looking at. And so it's like, that's kind of why it's like, it's not specific technology. It's, it's more of a, a a line of thinking. So it's, it's definitely interesting. It would be, like you said, it's getting above the weeds and kind of looking at the, what is it? The four, you can't see the forest, the trees. Yeah. It's like, it's getting up and looking at the forest a little right. bit. Which right. Would be interesting. Sounds very much like it's, it's pursuit of a closed loop. Yes. Yeah. Right. That all sounds very interesting. And our listeners should let us know if they would also be interested in that kind of video from you, because that can help inform Matt's channel. Yeah, if I do it or not. Moving on to the second half of our show, as usual, we will be talking about some of the things we are watching to pass the time. And I've just flipped a coin. <laughs> Heads or tails, Matt, which do you call? Heads. Okay. It was tails. That means you have to go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's, there's two things I was going to bring up. 
I've talked about this one before, I believe. Uh, season, the newest season of Cobra Kai <laughs> hit Netflix. And this is the first season that Netflix produced. It used to be a YouTube show, and now it's Netflix. And I was that sweet spot in the age demographic for when Karate Kid came out. So that that movie, like watching it again now, it is a cheesy, cheesy ass movie. But it, I've got nostalgia as a big thing for me for that movie. And so I watched Cobra Kai, and it is watching season three. It's one of those shows where it's like. I can't tell if it's good or bad, um, but but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> and the reason I can't tell if it's good or bad, it's like, I, I, it's like I've talked about the Saved by the Bell show, where the original Saved by the Bell is an awful show about a sociopath in high school. And the new show, the reboot, is just exceptional. And part of the reason it's exceptional is that the showrunner recognized that the original show is bad and recognized that the hero of the show was a sociopath. And so they made that the actual plot line of the new show. And so it's filmed in a similar style, but it's turning it on its head, giving it a modern take, and it's being ironic in the way it's looking at the original show. And it's 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 brilliant. This show feels like, and I can't tell what if it's brilliant or just, I don't want to be disparaging, but bad filmmaking, bad writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it, it feels like a continuation of schlocky 80s movies. And I can't tell if it's being done that way deliberately because it's being kind of very subtle in its ir- ironic take on it or if it's doing it not intentionally because they actually thought it was good. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So I don't know if it's a deliberate... It's it's not it's a little being a little too subtle and there's, there's aspects of it too, that I think that it's a deliberate choice because they do make fun of Johnny, the blonde guy who's the lead, of being completely out of touch. They have characters say things at times where it shows that the they they seem to recognize that this is kind of silly. But then 95% of the time, it's like it's taking itself so seriously. It's like I, I can't tell if they're <laughs> right, <laughs> if it's good or bad. Right. But I, I'm I'm enjoying it. It's like it is a cheesy cheesy soap opera drama with the high school students and the love triangles and all that kind of stuff but this season um they brought back another character from the original they brought back actually several characters from the original movies um karate kid 2 which took place in japan they brought back the love interest from that and they brought back the villain the the guy that Oh he God. fought <laughs> they're both they're both in this season and the when they brought them back it is those were some of the best episodes of the season. It was like, it was really funny and touching at times. And then, um, the other character they brought back was Elizabeth shoe. Hmm. She is actually in this season. And I said to my wife, after watching her episode where they revealed her and she came back, I said, There's no, the, the actors in this show are fine. And the cheesiness is coming from the writing and the filmmaking. It's not that they can't act. It's just that they're average, decent actors. They're none of them are like top tier talent. They're they're very good, but they're not great. You have Elizabeth Shue come in, who is a phenomenal actress, <laughs> and suddenly it was apparent of like, oh, oh, yeah. oh, that's that's really good acting, right. and you're okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of like it was almost a mistake to bring her in because it kind of just shined a light on okay, this is somebody who's really good and this is somebody who's okay. Right. Um, but nobody's bad. It's just, you, it's like the minor leagues for the, versus the major leagues in baseball. It's like right. you can, right. you can, they're all, they're all talented, but there's different levels of talent here at play. But anyway, I'm watching that. Show. I, I'm almost done with that show. I'm on the final episode. If you like cheesy entertainment and you're just looking for something to put on the background, I'd recommend watching it, but go in knowing it is... Oh man, it is made with extra cheese. The the stuff, you know, it's like the cheese stuffed crust pizzas. It is right. it's over the top. Um, the other thing I was going to bring up was I finally watched the movie Mank from David Fincher mm-hmm. um, on Netflix. And <sighs> he's my favorite filmmaker, period, that's making movies today. I, I love pretty much everything the guy does. Um, his style is right up my alley. Uh, 
but I don't know how I feel about this movie. It's like, it's, I'm a huge fan of Citizen Kane. Um, I actually talked to you about this once. I said, I watched this in Kane. I've probably seen it over a dozen times, easily over a dozen times. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I saw it in college for the first time and I've, I've watched it on, on a regular basis. It's, it's a phenomenal film. And this movie does a great job evoking that film style like david fincher is like he made an amazing movie that feels like a sequel and a companion to citizen kane but my problem with it is i found it extremely boring um Mm. i did not find it compelling in the slightest until like basically the final act it wasn't interesting to me until the second half of the film the first half felt like meandering and it didn't really, I didn't really care about the character. And I was, and as I love Gary Oldman, because the guy has a rubber face. It's like he, he, there's been movies I've watched with him in it. And I don't realize it's him until halfway in. I'm like, oh my, oh my God, I'm watching Gary Oldman. It's like, he looks like the completely different person in every movie he's in. I find him a distracting choice for this character. And it's not that he's a bad at the character because he's exceptional. The problem is he's playing a 42 year old. Hmm. He's in his sixties. Yeah, It's like, it was so distracting with him with all these young, beautiful people. And he's supposed to be this super charismatic guy that people kind of glom onto. And I just didn't believe it. It's like, here's this over slightly overweight <laughs> retiree, <laughs> essentially, mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to play somebody that's younger than me. And it was just like that. It was so distracting that it, it I had trouble believing what i was watching and it took me until the basically the end of the movie to really get attached to it so for me it's like i have a feeling i'm going to rewatch this movie like in a year let let some thoughts percolate and then rewatch it again because it's it is an exceptionally well made film i just don't know if it's a good film and it's going to take me a while to kind of wrap my head around it something tells me that in time this movie will be kind of like a timeless one of david fincher's kind of like people will look at this as his, where he peaked creatively. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that's going to happen, but like, I still don't, it's not, it's not clicking with me yet. I don't know if you, you saw it, right? I have not yet seen it. I watched the way we talked about it previously. I watched Citizen Kane for the first time just recently. And we did that in anticipation of watching Mank. So we have not yet seen it. Because I'm really curious what you're going to think after seeing it. Because I, I have a feeling you'll like it more out of the out of the gate than i did but mm. like it there's some genuinely funny moments like there's aspects of it that i thought were really distracting like the sound i found obnoxiously distracting because the f- soundtrack is mono they they literally made this to feel like citizen kane where mm. citizen kane is a mono audio track so you have this amazing score by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, which is just, it's nothing like you've heard from them before. It sounds like music that would have come from that era. It's, it's exceptional, but it's weird listening. I, I watched the movie on my surround sound system and because it's a mono track coming out of surround sound, it sounded really weird and voices coming not from the screen, but kind of coming from everywhere at once from the front. And it was, it was oddly, it was an odd choice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like it's like okay, you can do mono, but you could do mono from the center channel to make it sound more centralized to a surround sound setup, and mm-hmm. they didn't do that. So it's got this weird expansive audio that's not in stereo. It's 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 weird. And so there was I found there was aspects of this that I thought were poor choices, mm-hmm. um, but I understood why they were doing it. I just thought they were poor choices. So for me, the things that I have been most recently in touch with are the continuation of my girlfriend and I are watching the filmography of Polly Platt. I've mentioned her before. Mm -hmm. We watched Targets first as the first film that she was involved with. And now we've moved on to the second. And right out of the gate, Polly Platt and Peter Bogdanovich, her at that time husband who directed and wrote the screenplay for this movie, They went from Targets on to The Last Picture Show, which was, in 1971, one of the most well-received and impactful films of the year. And we watched it just the other night. And I have seen this one before, and I had forgotten 
I had not forgotten how much I enjoyed it, but I had forgotten specific plot points. So the movie was able to surprise me. And if nobody, if people have not seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. It is an incredibly moving film and I think still relevant today. It is about a town that is effectively drying up in Texas in the 1950s. And there are a lot of people today who see this happening in their communities. And I think it's part of the reason why there's a lot of anger in our politics right now. There are big pockets of people who feel ignored. Mm -hmm. And I say that as pockets of people on every side of the political spectrum. And this movie speaks not to specific political viewpoints, but to the inequalities in class and when you have people who have nothing but each other, how that kind of desperation can lead to a simmering anger that when it comes out, it explodes. And there are moments in this, even though it is a quiet picture by and large, it is, it has moments of, of tension that come from elements of misogyny, um, sexual predatory actions, people putting themselves in positions where they see themselves as second class citizens and if not embrace it, accept it. And it's hard to watch at times, even while being beautifully filmed and the story itself being as powerful as it is. Hmm. I've never seen it. It's, it's one of those that is definitely worth checking out. Uh, the other thing that we watched recently that I know you've talked about is the queen's gambit. We've started watching that. We are now, I think four episodes into it Mm -hmm. and it is one of the best television programs I've ever seen. It is absolutely (laughs) top to bottom. Um, it, every moment feels packed with information and like the best years of any program, like I, I always When I say this, I always think of season four, five, six of The Simpsons. It feels longer than it actually can be. You watch Mm -hmm. an episode of this, you feel like you've watched a two-hour movie. And Mm -hmm. you've watched something that's roughly 45 to 50 minutes long. It Every moment feels so packed with information. You are so captivated by what you're seeing that it feels like you're swimming through a lot more material than you actually are. And I think that that's a remarkable feat and it's beautifully written. It is beautifully acted and it has moments where I just want characters to hug each other. Mm-hmm. I just want, I just want people to yeah. be like, look, I, you're great. I love you. I want people to say that to each other and they do everything, but it is, it's the kind of world where people drift past each other and look sidelong at each other and wish for things for each other, but won't put them into words. And it's, it's that kind of tension. And for the first two or three episodes, I watched it with an extremely difficult backache because I was so tense while watching it. It is somehow, <laughs> while being about chess, one of the most <laughs> tension filled <laughs> stories I've ever seen. I watch it with every muscle clenched. So it is it's a lovely piece of filmmaking. It's a television program, but it's film. And the acting when they're playing chess, it's like the chess, evidently, I'm not a huge chess player, but the chess games are completely accurate. And Mm -hmm. like if you, people have taken the entire games and plotted out what the moves actually were and they're actually playing quote games. Right. Um, But the movie the show never explains any of what's going on or right. why they're making the moves they're going be, doing because it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. And what they focused on is the emotion of the playing the game and the reactions of the characters that they're playing the game. And she is so spectacular in in the show. Like mm-hmm. she conveys so much with just a look, just the look mm-hmm. in her eyes. Um, it's so good. I love that show. And that's available on Netflix as is the final show I wanted to talk about, which is the history of swear words. (laughs) That's a, that's a sudden right turn. (laughs) It is, it is the perfect balance to something like the queen's gambit where 
at the end of the Queen's Gambit, I am so fraught with tension because of that rook that was in danger. And then you move on to the history of swear words, which is hosted by Nicolas Cage. And <laughs> Wait, what? it is a remarkable <laughs> documentary about swear words. It is a series. And the first episode is about the word fuck. And it goes through the etymology of the word its first known references and how its usage has changed over time. It talks about people's use of it in their personal lives, the impact it has in conversation. They take a a holistic approach to these words. And while doing that, it is also funny. They are Uh interviewing comedians who talk about it. So the comedians are able to talk about it in amusing ways. They talk to actual word experts. One of the main people that um, is involved in the show is a editor for the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Another person who was introduced in the one of the most recent episodes I watched on the word bitch was a uh, feminism professor whose expertise is in the intersection between feminism and racism are not the intersection between feminism and racism, the intersection between misogyny and racism huh. and the oppressive use of terminology in keeping people down. And so they have extremely academic viewpoints. They have pedestrian viewpoints from the comedians who just talk about usage in a, in a daily way. They talk about the feeling of words. They have the author of a book about the history of the word fuck. Um, he's in multiple episodes. He's a, he's a semiotics professor, I believe. Again, it's, it's a mixture of, of all these different takes on language and it is actually very fascinating. And it's a little bit like drunk history in that it (laughs) is, a dive into these historical moments with humor as the sugar to get you to take the medicine. You are learning information while being entertained. And I think it's actually a very, very good documentary. And Nicolas Cage as the host is the perfect choice because he (laughs) revels in saying these words. He plays the part of the, literally at the beginning of the episodes, he'll be sitting in a chair with a cognac and a book on his lap and he'll look up and go, Oh, hello. And then start the (laughs) dive into the examination of the word. When did this come out? When did this come out? It it came out, I think last week. Because I haven't heard a thing about this and this is like right up my alley. (laughs) Yeah. Both you and your wife will enjoy this. And it is his take on it. And the way the producers have put the show together is both he and they are riding on who he is. So they have one in reference to the word fuck. They talk about uh, its use in movies and its change of use over time. The, the way that language was used in films would affect the rating. And he says, let's take, for example, any randomly selected actor. And the graphic that pops up is him. <laughs> And it shows the breakdown of swear words that he uses in his movies. And fuck is, by and large, the the largest number. (laughs) Beneath that is shit and then assholes and then others is only like 3%. But fuck is the big hitter. And he said, again, this is just any randomly selected actor. And (laughs) so they're playing with the fact that it is him. And he is playing with the fact that it is him. And in the most recent episode, which was around bitch... He is talking about how it's used and you're using it is both an insult to, if you're using it to a man, you are insulting the man, but you're also insulting all women by using that term. You are saying you, the man are weak because you are like a woman and all women are weak. And they then suddenly cut to a clip from face off where he is... (laughs) screaming the word bitch into the face of a pilot where he is holding a gun to the pilot and he's screaming fly bitch fly and so it's this 
very uh, self-referential and knowing take on all of this stuff, both from the producers and from him. It's a lot of fun. It's very interesting. And it actually makes you think about language and how you use language and what you're doing with language. So, Wait, are you telling me, Sean, are you telling me that words matter? I'm saying words have meaning and they do matter, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's almost as if the tone of our social discourse may have an impact on people's actions. That can't, that can't possibly be, Sean. I can't buy that. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there and I'm going to invite you <laughs> to think about it. And I'm going to invite our listeners to think about it too. Let us know what you think. Do you think that tone in social discourse actually matters? Or do you have a flywheel currently operating in your backyard? Let us know. <laughs> you can find our contact info in the podcast description. Please do subscribe. You can find the show at all the locations where podcasts are. You know where those locations are. You know the services I'm talking about. I don't have to name them. Matt doesn't want me to waste our time. <laughs> when you're doing that, please be sure to give us a rating, a review, and do share us with your friends. It really does help the podcast. The podcast really helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew. And then I watch Nicolas Cage swear. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. You can reach out to us through the contact. Of, mm, boy. Wow. Contact. <laughs> 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 <laughs>